Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. A woman brought a very limp duck into a veterinary surgeon. She laid her pet on the table. The vet pulled out a stethoscope and listened to the bird's chest. After a moment or two, the vet shook his head sadly and said, I'm sorry, your duck has passed away. The distressed woman wailed, are you sure? He said, yes, I'm sure the duck is dead. How can you be so sure, she protested. I mean, you haven't done any testing on him or anything. He might just be in a coma or something. Reluctantly, the vet turned around and left the room. He returned a few minutes later with a black Labrador retriever. As the duck's owner looked on in amazement, the dog stood on his hind legs, put his front paws on the examination table, and sniffed the duck from top to bottom. He then looked up at the vet with sad eyes, whined, dropped his head. The vet patted the dog on the head and took it out of the room. A few minutes later, he returned with a cat. The cat jumped on the table and also delicately sniffed the bird from head to foot. The cat sat back on its haunches, meowed softly and sadly, and then strolled out of the room. The vet looked at the woman and said, I'm sorry, but as I said, this is most definitely 100% certifiably a dead duck. The vet turned to his computer terminal, hit a few keys, produced a bill, which he handed to the woman. <clears throat> the duck's owner took the bill, and with great shock, she said, $750, $750 just to tell me that my duck is dead. The vet shrugged and said, I'm sorry, if you'd just taken my word for it, the bill would have been $25, but now with the lab report and the CAT scan, it's now $750. The truth and diagnosis of Scripture is that all men apart from Christ are dead, spiritually dead in their sins and separated from the life of God. Paul had spoken about all the blessings that God has blessed us with in Christ by God's grace in Ephesians chapter 1. Here Paul reminds the Ephesians and us, the body of Christ, of our past, and we learn how truly undeserving we are for all that God has done for us by His grace. In these verses we are presented with the past, the present, and the future of the believer, what we were, what we are, and where we are going. Ephesians emphasizes and gives instruction for how the church of this dispensation, the church, the body of Christ, how it is to operate. Here in these verses, Paul reveals first how one becomes a member of the body of Christ. He speaks of how we are saved from sin, saved because of the mercy and love of God, saved by grace through faith, not of works. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead, in trespasses and sins. When Paul speaking of the Ephesian believers, their past condition, he says, you who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, unsaved people are very much alive physically, of course. The death Paul speaks of here is spiritual death. In God's word, the word death speaks of that, just speaks of separation. Paul is saying that in our sins, we are separated spiritually from God, from the life of God. Later in this book, and in chapter 4, verse 18, Paul says the same, that unbelievers are alienated from the life of God. Isaiah 59, 2 says, Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And Paul says in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. Sin results in death, physical death, spiritual death, and ultimately everlasting eternal death from God in the lake of fire. We are all born in sin because of our connection with Adam, and that's the reason that we all die. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned in Adam, in other words. We're all sinners in Adam and are born with a sin nature. 
Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we are all sinners by nature, and from that nature, we have all sinned and individually done sinful things and sinned against God. We're all sinners. We are all dead in trespasses and sins. All are separated from God. All are deserving of eternal judgment, and all are in need of forgiveness and life and reconciliation with God. Paul says we are dead in trespasses. And that word trespasses speaks of false steps, stepping out of line to deviate. The word sin speaks of falling short or missing the mark. All people have fallen short of the mark of God's glory, God's goodness, His righteousness and holiness, and are therefore dead, separated spiritually from God. Unbelievers aren't sick spiritually, they're dead spiritually, and they have a great need. The world is filled with people who are dead while they are alive, who need to be saved and given spiritual life, which only comes from Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 says, Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Continuing on with the spiritual condition of mankind outside of Christ, Paul paints a picture of the lost sinner, and it's not a pretty picture. It's bleak, and it's honest. Scripture does not sugarcoat. Scripture is a mirror which confronts us truthfully with how we stand before God. Paul says in time past when they were dead in sins and outside of Christ, the Ephesians, they walked according to the course of this world. An unbeliever's lifestyle follows the lifestyles of other unbelievers and conforms to the world's ways, standard of morality, in the way they think. Consciously or unconsciously, unbelievers walk or live according to the world's course or its order. Uh, by its system of values, its attitudes, its way of doing things. Unbelievers live by the mass of current or past thought, opinion, impulses, aims, and aspirations of this world and worldly people. They find their authority in popular opinion and by the great number who believe it and follow it, and they just go with the flow. And this world puts pressure on every person, both believing and unbelieving, to conform to what they think and what they believe. But Paul tells us and tells believers in Romans 12 too to be not conformed to this world. And walking according to the course of this world, unbelievers walk unknowingly according to the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan. The course of this world follows the leadership of Satan, who Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, is the God of this world. Behind the scenes, the world is a satanically organized system that hates and opposes God. Satan hates God, and he actually hates mankind, too. He is at work constantly to lead mankind to destroy their own lives and to keep people from being saved, to blind the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them, as 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says. The power of the air that Satan is the prince over is the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places that Paul speaks of later in chapter 6, verse 12. He is the God of this world, and he is ruler over the demonic host. And because of his power over this world system and through the demonic hosts of hell, Satan influences the lives of all unbelievers. Colossians 1.13 speaks of how when we trust Christ, that we are delivered from the power of darkness. Unbelievers, unknowingly, they live under the authority of Satan. Christ told the unbelieving Pharisees in John 8.44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the less of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Unbelievers live in darkness under Satan's authority and are subject to his lusts, his desires, his deceptions, 
his influences. And as he influences unbelievers, he not only attempts to get man to do evil things and to destroy their lives by sin, he's even more concerned with trying to get man to think in wrong, to believe in error, so that they follow him in his opposition to God, the God of the Bible. Being a liar and the father of it, he influences mankind to believe lies, to worship the creation, to worship false gods. Satan does his greatest work in the church and in religion. Through outright false doctrine and also by subtly mixing truth with error, he works to confuse and lead people away from Christ, away from trusting the all-sufficiency of his cross and resurrection. He also influences and deceives people to live aimlessly for themselves according to the course of the world, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Since Satan is himself disobedient to God, he works to keep unbelievers as children of disobedience to God and to his word and to his will. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Colossians, The Preeminence of Christ, is a hardcover, 256-page commentary written by Pastor Cornelius R. Stan. As the head of the body, Christ holds the preeminent position in the church. This wonderful truth was a special revelation solely committed to the Apostle Paul. Perhaps one of the most insidious attacks he encountered was the false teaching of Gnosticism. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. Ephesians 2 verse 3 says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past and the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Paul says, among whom, meaning numbered among, or being one ourselves, referring to being children of disobedience from verse 2. Paul says, in time past, when we were all children of disobedience, we lived in the lusts of our flesh. So we find the believers three main enemies in these two verses, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Before we were saved, we were dominated and influenced by these three. The unbeliever lives to please the lusts of their flesh, lives by their strong inclinations, the passionate longings, the evil cravings of the flesh and our sinful nature. The unbeliever lives according to the longings of the flesh and then he acts upon these inclinations as it says they're fulfilling the desires, carrying out the desires of the flesh and the wishes and corrupt reasoning of their darkened mind. The unbeliever is abandoned to doing whatever feels good and makes them happy. They act on the authority of self and their own mind as being the ultimate authority so the conduct of the unsaved we see all around us is lived according to the constant, ever-changing, selfish cravings of the desires of the flesh in which no true fulfillment or satisfaction is ever found. Instead, only emptiness and meaninglessness is found in those things. Nothing should surprise us, really, when we hear about the horrible things that take place in the world because we know that sin is the problem. These horrible things that we hear that take place should only remind us how desperately the world needs Christ and how desperately they need His salvation and life and the transformation to our lives that He can give us by His grace. Christ is the answer in every way. A key word in verse 3 is had. 
Paul speaks of the believer's past and he's implying that these things should remain there and shouldn't be true of believers who have power, according to chapter 1, the end of chapter 1, the resurrection power within us to live above the ways of the world and not according to the flesh or the devil. It shows, though, that believers can live like they used to live before trusting Christ, and they can live like unbelievers and get, get caught up in the course of this world and live by the desires of the flesh. Those who have not received God's salvation through Christ, we learn here, are the children of wrath. Man, by deed, in what he does, according to verse 2, is a child of disobedience. By nature, it says in verse 3, he is a child of wrath. And that goes back to verse 1. Being dead in trespasses and sins, all are worthy of, subject to, and appointed to God's wrath and doomed to eternal judgment and punishment in the lake of fire, to be eternally separated from God there. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 presents a hopeless and doomed picture of guilty mankind who's dead in their sins, who deserve nothing but God's wrath and judgment. And the picture is to give us a burden for the loss. It gives us a true snapshot of the world. The world likes to make excuses for their behaviors, but God's word is honest, and God's word tells it like it is. Mankind is spiritually dead, separated from God in his life, living according to the influences of the world and the devil. Man is disobedient, controlled by the sinful, empty, wicked lusts of their flesh and their darkened mind, and they are under the wrath of God and heading for judgment. Verses 1 to 3 is a picture of people outside of Christ, and it's the truth, and it shows how we all need the mercy and the grace of God. Ephesians 2, 4 to 5 say, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. You've seen the bad news in verses 1 to 3. Now you got the good news, and the good news is, but God. Singer Stephen Curtis Chapman states, In the gospel we discover we are far worse off than we thought and far more loved than we ever dreamed. The issue of salvation and eternal life is not what man can do for God, but what God has done for us. It's not us trying to reach God. It's what God and His love and His grace has done in reaching down and coming to us. The words, but God, introduces God's actions towards sinners. What we deserve is for the message to end at verse 3. That would be justice. But God, in verse 4, introduces mercy, love, and grace. The focus turns from sinful man to a merciful and a loving God. In God's mercy, He does not give us what we do deserve. And it says here, God is rich in mercy. It is exhaustless, abundant, overflowing. Psalm 103, verse 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Micah 7.18 tells us that God delights in mercy. The entire 136th Psalm tells us that the Lord's mercy endures forever. Instead of dealing with man in wrath and what we deserve, He deals with us in compassionate mercy. And all of us should be so glad for that. And God loves us with a great love, it says in verse 4. And out of that great love, Romans 8 tells us that he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. We've sinned against God. God cannot have one sin in his presence. He must punish sin. And sin's just deserving penalty is death. But God is rich in mercy and loves us. And he sent the son of his love to die for us, to bear the punishment and to die for our sins so that we might be saved from our sins by faith in Him, that we might be saved from hell, so that we might be forgiven and not eternally separated from God, but to spend eternity with God in heaven forever. Out of God's great love, He sought our greatest and highest good. 
even though we don't deserve it at all. And even when we were dead in sins and in great need, spiritually dead and needing new life, He quickened us, as it says there in verse 5. Quickened us when we believe that Christ died for me and rose again. And at that moment, He gave us life, spiritual, eternal life, so that we'll never be separated from God. He made us spiritually alive together with Christ, uniting us completely to Him for eternity, giving us life, making us alive in Christ. We are no longer alienated from the life of God. We are joined to Christ Himself. We are born again and have new life, the very life of God in Christ. Colossians 2.13 says, And you, being dead in your sins, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Paul says being made alive is all because of grace here, as by grace we are saved. It's not that we might be saved or we will be saved. We are saved the moment we trust Christ as our personal Savior. Salvation is completely the work of God. It is by grace alone. It is simply a gift. God in His grace helps the helpless, and we are helpless. He helps the undeserving, and we are undeserving. He helps those who failed to achieve His standard, and that's every single one of us. And by His grace, we are saved and made alive in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7 say, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Also by his mercy, love, and grace, God has raised us, the church, the body of Christ. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The heavenly places is the unique hope for the church, the body of Christ. We see so clearly outside of Paul's letter that for the nation of Israel, the hope for them is the earth. Outside of Christ, we are dead in our sins. But the moment we believe, God identifies and unites us with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. And we are raised up and raised up high, given newness of life and given a seated position in Christ in the heavenlies. We are in Christ and are joined to our Savior. So as our Savior has been raised up, exalted, seated in heavenly places, we being in Christ also raised up, exalted, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God has exalted and honored us highly in Him, given us an eternal position in Christ in the heavenlies. God has seated us in Christ in the heavenlies where we will rule and reign for all eternity. God says this is a present spiritual reality, a reality that we are to live in light of. Colossians 3, 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. As we seek those things which are above in heaven, that's where Christ is, our Savior. That's where our home is. That's where our exalted position is, seated in Christ in heavenly places. We're now to live in light of the fact that this world is not our home, that we honor as we keep our focus on Him, that we honor our Lord and Savior with our lives, that we live by the values of heaven and our position in Him. Before salvation, we were dead. Now we live. We lived according to the course of the world. Now we live according to the course of the Word of God. We lived according to and under the authority of Satan. Now we live according to and under the authority of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We lived according to the desires of the flesh. Now we live according to the new life, the new man imparted within. We were children of disobedience, children of wrath. Now we are sons of God, saved from wrath, children of life and exalted in the heavenlies. So sure is God's promise of our life and hope in Christ that God 
sees us as already there. It's as good as done in God's eyes. We are already there, currently seated there in heavenly places. And for eternity, the body of Christ will glorify God for His grace. Forever will be the demonstrations of the riches of God's grace. And forever, it says here, He will show His endless, limitless kindness to us through Christ Jesus. We'll never stop receiving grace and kindness from God. And God will be eternally praised and glorified because of all that He has done for us. William Henley was born in 1849 in Gloucester, England. He was crippled since childhood and a staunch humanist. He wrote Invictus, which is often quoted by valedictorians at graduations. And it reads like this. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. In this poem, we see Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. We see the course of this world. And we see the pride of man. In answer to Henley's Invictus, a believer in Christ by the name of Dorothea Day wrote a poem called My Captain. In it, we see one who is alive in Christ and touched by the grace of God. She writes this. Out of the light that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I know to be for Christ, the conqueror of my soul. Since His the sway of circumstance, I would not wince nor cry aloud. Under that rule which men call chance, my head with joy is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears, there is life with Him. And His the aid, despite the menace of the years, keeps and shall keep me unafraid. I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared the punishment from the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, May you be transformed by God's grace.